Okay, sisters and brothers, happy International Working Women's Day. Welcome to one of many activities that are happening today and throughout the month. And we're going to be sharing this information with you today. My name is Monica Moorhead. I'm one of the coordinators for the International Working Women's Day Coalition and also representing the Women's Fight Back Network and the International Women's Alliance. And what we would like to do right now is to, because we are at the Triangle Fire Memorial, which we all know what happened on May, March, on March it was it March 8, 1911, that a tremendous tragedy, heinous crime happened here when 146 mainly women, immigrant garment workers lost their lives when the bosses, the greedy bosses, shut the exit doors, locked them, and creating a massacre of these workers. Some of them even jumped to their deaths trying to escape the fires. And as part of a, a ceremony that we usually do on International Working Women's Day, we would like to read some of the names some of the names of the victims of the fire at this point in time and throughout the rally, we're going to be reading uh, names of the, all of the victims or as many victims as we can. And so we want to start our ceremony today with some reading, the reading of some of the victims and how old they were when they perished. And then we're going to wait until our speaker finishes with this set of names and then we're all going to say pre presente. Okay, so, at, and then we're going to call on the, one of the organizers for the one o'clock rally, the Women Organized to Resist and Defend. Karina Garcia is going to come on after our first speaker to make an announcement as to what's going to happen for the rest of the day. So I'd like to call on Lalanne Schoenstein, who is a retired uh, union member and a, a, a garment worker and also uh, Workers' World technical editor, and she's going to read the first set of names. Lillian? Okay. Julia Aberstein, 30 years old. Lizzie Adler, 24. Anna Altman, 16. Anna Ardito, 25. Becky Astrowski, 20. Rosa Bassino, 31. Vincenza Bellata, 16. Ignacia Bellato, 22. Vincenza Benanti, 22. Essie Bernstein, 19. Jacob Bernstein, 28. Morris Bernstein, 19. Mosey Bernstein. Gussie Berman, 22. Abraham Vincent, 20. Rosie Bredman, Sarah Bredman. Ida Broski, 16. Sarah Broski, 21. Ida Brooks. 18. Laura Brunette, 17. Caputa, 17. Joseph Carlisi, 31. Alvina Caruso, 20. Francis Caruto, 17. Posey Costello, 21. Rosie Cerrito, Anna Cohen, 25. Anna Coletti, 30. Della Costello. Rosie Crepo, 19. Francie Denent, 20. Yetta Detent Schultz, 18. Clara Dockman, 19. Kay Dorman. Calman Donick, 24. Cecilia Eisenberg, 17. Rosie Freiburg, Rebecca Freebus, 17, <coughs> Feltzer, 40, 
Dossi Lopez Retzi, 24. Presente! Presente! Good morning, everybody. My name is Chris Hilo. I'm from Gabriela, USA, Filipinas for Rights and Empowerment. Woo! Let's get excited because we are here today for International Women's Day. Uh, Dia de Internacional Mujeres, see? ¿sí? Um, we're here because we are, without women, we are nowhere. We cannot be anywhere. We have to have women in the struggle. This is our place as women. And for the men, you have to stand beside us as well to keep on fighting to ensure that we are on a path towards liberation. We have today a wonderful speaker named Karina Garcia. She's actually very involved in the action at 1 p.m. today in Washington Square. Everybody be there later, Washington Square, 1 p.m. Um, with our sisters for women organ organized to resist and defend. To resist and defend against what? Against the violence that we have to continually face every day that because of the current system that we are under. So I'm gonna ask my sister Karina Garcia to come up here, give a few words, um, and everybody please give her a warm welcome because it's still cold because it's winter. <laughs> everybody, thank you. Woo! Organized to resist and defend word. I'm very happy to be spending International Women's Day uh, the way our, fore our foremothers and generations of women have commemorated it, which is the only suitable way to commemorate it, and that's in the streets, taking action, making noise, and raising our voices. In just a little while, we're going to have a march that I know many of you are coming to. We're focusing on the theme of violence against women, taking inspiration from our sisters in India who electrified the country and the world by coming out in the thousands and showing their collective power against sexist violence. When we march to stop violence against women, we're not just marching against individual men, or the brutes or pigs as disgusting as they are. We are marching against the system that promotes the objectification of women, the view of women as the sexual property of men, that encourages and tolerates anti-women violence on a daily basis. We're marching against the police system that stops and frisks women, against the military, where rape culture is the dominant culture, and we're marching with the clear view that those are not the only forms of violence. Hunger, homelessness, unemployment, deportation, incarceration, these are all forms of violence against women and all of society. But we are confident that today's generation of young women can bring about this type of movement again. As we all know, no one was anticipating a mass women's movement taking off in India at the end of the last year. But when it happens, it seems inevitable. That's how it'll be in this country too. We have to be creative, we have to be provocative, and most importantly, we have to be in the streets. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Karina. Uh, we'll definitely be there at 1 o'clock. We'll be marching there. Um, also, here today, um, we are all united, not only as women, but also for the LGBT community, um, lesbian, gay, bi, trans, gender non-conforming community here in New York City. Uh, we also stand for their rights as well because we know that we have to be together, especially. We have to unite all of our issues together. Um, and when we say united, you gotta hear it. The women united will never be defeated. 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 So I asked on my sister Egypt, 
from uh, Trans Justice and the Audrey Lord Project, whom we love very much, an organization that keeps on empowering LGBT people of color community here in New York City. And uh, I want you all to welcome her, Miss Egypt. I didn't hear that. Uh -oh. Hello, my name is Yvonne Egypt. I'm the co-coordinator of Trans Justice at the Orthodox Project. And the reason why I'm here is because trans women have the right to work too. You know, I go to school and I get degrees. It's like everyone else. And I, sh I should be looked at not the content of my character, not the gender that I am. Okay, so if when I go to a job, I shouldn't have to be discriminated against because of I'm a woman. And, and everybody can see I am a woman, but a man in this man's world, they feel that women should be in the home cooking and making babies. So we have to stop that now and from now on and stand up women and stand up for your rights. Thank you. Thank you, Egypt. Um, next we're going to have Janine Ventura, who is a leader of Gabriella USA. Please welcome her. Good morning, warm and militant greetings as we commemorate International Working Women's Day at this site of the tragic shirt, Triangle Shirtwaist Fire that happened many years ago. And over a hundred years since that fire, these labor violations and human rights abuses continue to persist in support of U.S. imperialism. In New Orleans, hundreds of Filipino oil company workers were trafficked and employed by the Grand Isle Shipyard Corporation, or GIS. Three of those workers died in an oil platform explosion last year, a platform cited for serious OSHA violations, all due to capitalist greed, just like the Triangle Shirtwaist tragedy. Over a hundred years since that fire here charred the bodies of mostly immigrant working women. Three GIS Filipino workers suffered the same fate and hundreds more risked their lives every day. These labor trafficking victims are just some of the 4,500 Filipinos who leave the country every day and 70% of whom are women. Worsening poverty has forced the migration of Filipinos to work overseas who often find themselves working jobs where they are vulnerable to violence and exploitation. In, US, in the U.S. government policies and free trade laws like NAFTA and the imminent Trans-Pacific Partnership fail to protect Filipino overseas workers and other overseas workers. Many Filipino migrant workers in the U.S. are forced into low-wage contract labor, often without worker protections and living wages, or become victims to illegal labor practices and human trafficking. It is clear that both the U.S. and Philippine governments are failing to protect the safety and well-being of Filipinas and their families. Fire Gabriela USA calls on Filipinas and allies everywhere to join the struggle to stop the economic violence of Filipino women and children perpetuated by U.S. imperialism. We must continue to fight for more living wage jobs and for an end to labor trafficking. We must stop the imperialist exploitation and oppression of women and children. Thank you. Makibaka, wang matakot. Long live international solidarity. Long live international solidarity. Long live international solidarity. Long live international solidarity. In regards to internationalism and why we're all here today as a people in the United States of America, long live the international solidarity because we are a country of migrants, immigrants, people of color, people who have been forced to come here because due to the social economic things that are happening in our home countries. And more, and here today, I want to welcome Ms. Nieves from La Peña del Bronx, which is a multicultural racial community movement that is empowering the South Bronx, doing main campaigns for the workers and immigrants in the community of the South Bronx. But today she is also going to commemorate um, the recently who passed away um, president of Venezuela, Hugo Chavez. If anybody can remember all the things that happened with Hugo Chavez is that he stood for women. He stood for women. 
not just any women, the poorest of the poor women in Venezuela. Even the women back home or back in Venezuela would say they thought Chavez is us, he is our son. And also he depended on the women to make sure that he would be able to help the poor in Venezuela. And he had said only women have the passion and the love to make the revolution. So we are here today to remember and commemorate and, and, and also on March 8th was the funeral of him. So let us commemorate and celebrate Hugo Chavez as a community of women. Please give it up for Ms. Nieves from La Peña de Bronx. And going to translate for her. Viva Manuelita Sáenz! Viva Tania la Guerrillera! Viva! Viva Harry Topman! Viva! Viva la Comandante Ramona! Viva! Viva Lolita Lebrón! Viva! Viva Violeta Parra! Viva! Viva Mamá Tingó! Viva! Viva Vilma Espín! Viva! Somos más de la mitad del mundo y traemos la otra mitad. We're more than half of the world and we bring the other half to, to birth. Y cuidamos a la humanidad. And we take care of the whole humanity. Hoy en el Día Internacional de la Mujer saludamos al pueblo venezolano. Today in International Women's Workers Day we greet the Venezuelan people. Y saludamos al Comandante Chávez porque él no ha muerto, él está vivo. And we salute um, Comandante Chávez because he's not dead. He's alive. Long live the Commandant Chavez. Él en una reunión hace unos años atrás estaban todas las mujeres reunidas hablando sobre el problema y la situación de la mujer. A few years ago, in a meeting, he was there with Venezuelan women talking about women's issues. Y dijo a todos los machistas, a todos los que tienen un poquito de machismo. And he said to all machistas, and even if you have just a little bit of machismo, esta revolución es feminista. This revolution is a feminist revolution. Por la igualdad de los derechos de la mujer y que la mujer sea respetada. It is for women's equality and for respect for women. Porque sin la participación de la mujer no hay revolución ni cambios en la sociedad. Because without women's participation, there is no revolution or change in society. Seguimos su legado, comandante. Comandante de la dignidad. We follow your legacy, comandante. Uh, comandante of dignity. Comandante de la igualdad internacionalista. Comandante of equality, international equality. Comandante de la solidaridad. Comandante, comandante of solidarity. Comandante de la esperanza. And comandante of hope. Hasta la victoria final, lucharemos por vuestro legado. Well, hasta la victoria final. <laughs> we'll fight and in the struggle for your legacy. Con toda la fuerza de la historia. Con toda la fuerza de la historia. Palabra de mujer. With all the force of history, it's a woman's word. Yes. Thank you. Um, I would like to read just very briefly before I call on our next speaker a short segment from the International Working Women's Day statement that was put out a few days ago. And this is an international women's alliance from almost every continent. And it says here, the International Women's Alliance calls on women all over the globe to advance their ongoing struggles against imperialist globalization and the crisis of capitalism by mobilizing with militant actions on May 8, March 8th to commemorate International Working Women's Day. The International Conference of Working Women over 100 years ago gave birth to what is now properly known as International Women's Day. The origin of this day was to highlight the resistance and organizing power of working women to gain the right to fair wages and working hours, the right to vote, and end to discrimination. 
Today, we must remember to hold true to the origins of March 8th and return to the important issues that we're raising today that weigh heavily on women all over the world, the crisis of capitalism and imperialism. That is the struggle of the 99%, which includes a great portion of women against the 1%, the vicious, greedy ruling classes. The March 8th IWD calls on women who are active in the struggles locally, nationally, and globally to build solidarity and organize militant actions for IWD. And during March 8th actions, we invite women's organizations to wear purple armbands, as we're doing today, to show solidarity across, across actions globally. And some of the demands are in imperialist wars of aggression and intervention, including in Occupy Palestine, Afghanistan, Puerto Rico, Haiti, Africa, Latin America, Asia, and elsewhere. Genuine land agrarian reform now. Jobs paying, union wages or livable income. Health care, housing, education, food now. No to racist immigration policies, police brutality, and mass incarceration, in deportations, in forced migration and human trafficking, stop modern day slavery and violence against women, free all political prisoners in developing and, deve and developed countries. We call on the freedom for Lynn Stewart, Cece McDonald, a black trans woman, women in the Move Nine who've been in prison for over 30 years, Dr. Afia Siddiqui, a victim of the so-called U.S. War on Terror, and many, many more. And in political repression and human rights violations right now. This is part of the statement of IWA, and we're very proud to be a part of this very important global alliance. And right now, I would like to call on a sister who has been very active in the community here in terms of supporting the right of school children to transportation, especially those children who have special needs, and also building broad alliances with the community because women are a big part of the community. We are central to, to the community. And just recently, this sister was very much a part of organizing solidarity for the school bus drivers and matrons who, who had a heroic strike against Bloomberg for better security in their jobs. So I'm very proud to introduce Sarah Catalanato, who is a co-leader of Parents to Improve School Transportation. Let's welcome Sister Sarah. School busing is a women's issue. Safe and equal access to schools should be a right and a public service, but it's now done for profit. The mayor and his puppets went out of their way to short change school bus workers and riders by soliciting low bids to benefit the companies, not the classroom. This provoked a strike, as you know. The Wall Streeters injured and then insulted our children, especially students with disabilities, by depriving them of school and then insulting them by bragging that the city saved money in those four weeks that they didn't transport the children. Parents, most often mothers, learned if they didn't already know that the system does not care about our children unless we organize and fight. About 5,300 women, drivers, and matrons, together with 3,500 men, struck to save seniority hiring, to directly save the jobs of just 22 or 2,300 people in the routes going out to bid for uh, June and next September. Though the leadership of the international and local is still mostly white males, dynamic women leaders emerge on the picket lines who reflect the multicultural rank and file, including many, many immigrants. The attack on busing can be pushed back by continued active solidarity between those who provide a crucial service and those who need this service, which was won by the disabled movement and the civil rights movement in the first place. 
If you're against sexism, racism, and union busting, if you support education for all and job security for all, please support the campaign for a school bus bill of rights. I'll be giving out the flyers. Thank you. Happy International Women's Day. Thank you. All right. Um, also today, from Harlem, we have Sister Bertha Aiken, who is from Coalition to Save Harlem. If everybody knows here, Harlem is going, is going under immense gentrification in the communities and the black communities. And we have sisters there that are fighting against the gentrification and fighting for affordable housing for the community. Let's take it to the street, sisters. Let's welcome Bertha Aiken. Thank you. Thank you. And to all sisters and our brothers, very supportive, thank you. To our sisters in Harlem, uh, uh, we are still fighting the same, as you said, gentrification. Um, the developers are there big time. They are linking in with not-for-profit organizations and, of course, leaving out like tenant associations and others that will really be forceful in helping the tenants. And I think right now, a lot of the tenants are just, just getting so frustrated. The meetings are still ongoing, but the tenant associations, like in the housing, for instance, the housing authority, they continue to vote in the same people that in collaboration with the uppers. So what's happening is that we still have to keep fighting and, and forging ahead because we have to put the new people in the tenant association to work for us. For us. Now you have the till housing, uh, you have all sorts of housing that's still under attack. They are still uh, renovating or so-called capital improvement and with that, the tenants cannot get back in because there's no way that they can afford the rent. Uh, some of them were still paying 400, 600 a month. And to go back in with smaller apartments after the renovation, and then you're paying 1,200 to uh, 2,000 a month depending. And you're not having the same amount of room that you would need for your family. So this also forces the residents to move out. And those who can live together, that's a problem because you know that they're monitoring who's in the apartment, constant inspections, and all of these things that just sort of keep the people out, and many move out. So right now, uh, we know that we are a Harlem of immigrants, and right now they are forcing us out. But we are going to stay. We are going to remain united, and those of us that are left, we will do what, we need, what needs to be done. And I ask you now, women all over, Every issue is a woman's issue, but you must stay empowered on your jobs. Reach out to those sisters and those that have been in this activism for many, many years. That is your brace. Use them. They're waiting. Sometimes you know who they are, but a little afraid. Find your lunch hour. Find time to talk to these women and go back to your homes and organize. Organize, grow, and unite and be empowered. Thank you. Thank you, Bertha. It is right, that is right. That is our right as women and as community to continue to rouse, organize, and mobilize. Again, arouse, organize, and mobilize. Get into the streets. Talk to the people. Talk outside your comfort zone. Talk to people about these issues because if we don't talk about them, it won't happen. Change will not happen. We have to continue to fight. And especially for women workers, this is one of the big things that we have always been fighting for, a change in our economic structure. Especially now in this New York City, we have domestic workers all over taking care of children of higher classes. And we want to ensure that domestic workers, just recently they passed their Bill of, Re of Rights a few years ago, and we must continue to still educate, organize, and mobilize the poorest of the poor, and uh, the, some of the most exploited workers in this New York City economy. Today we have a, a sister from Kabalikat, which means shoulder to shoulder in Filipino, a domestic worker group of immigrant Filipino women that are organizing on the daily other Filipino women and other domestic workers. So I asked Lorena Sanchez, one of the main coordinators from Kabalikat, to come here 
The workers united will never be defeated. The workers united will never be defeated. The workers united will never be defeated. So give it up for Lorena Sanchez. A very pleasant good good day to everyone. Kabalikat is here, um, first of all, to in honor of the brave women of the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory. And we are here as well to celebrate with everybody International Working Women's Day, for we are migrant women workers. More than half of the 4,700 migrants living in the Philippines every day are women. They are bound to destinations where they have no protection from the Philippine government. They face racism, wage theft, slavery, trafficking, and exploitation. Why do we face these conditions? Because we are mothers. We are grandmothers. We are sisters. We are daughters. We are friends. We have families and communities back home who depend on us. We have been called the modern heroes of the nation for sending remittances that make up 18% of the GDP of the Philippines. But for us, it is more visceral than that. It's about sending our children to school, making sure that we have a roof over their heads, putting food on the table, caring for them when they get sick. All of these just to survive. They call us heroes. We call ourselves ordinary people simply trying to uplift our families. In struggling to protect our families, we do extraordinary things. We come from a long line of working women who want to change the world for the better, whether it's as personal as sending our children to school or as big as standing for, our, for better working conditions for domestic workers. We are heroes to the Philippine state because we send our remittances back home. We are heroes to the American families because we take care of their children. But we do not want to be called heroes. We ask not to be separated from our families, to be able to work at home, to have the choice to stay with our families. We ask that we make migration a choice and not a way to survive, for we simply are mothers, grandmothers, daughters, sisters, and friends. Mabuhay ang mga kababaihan. Ipagpatuloy natin ang ating paglaban. Mabuhay! Mabuhay! Thank you. Okay, sisters and brothers, we're going to really try to move the program along because we do want to march and go to the Word Rally, and there will be a march coming out of the Word, a word Rally going to put police precincts and to Stonewall to show solidarity with various communities. And as you can see here, but I do want to point out an introduction to our next speaker, that you'll see a number of important signs, signs that reflect our coalition's motto that every issue is a woman's issue, but also reflecting the women warriors that have come before us, some who have who lived to be a ripe old age and some who actually were killed and martyred in the struggle. And one woman in particular that we are paying homage to today and throughout the month is Sister Harriet Tubman, who was an important leader of the Underground Railroad uh, uh, when slavery was at its height in this country. She was a union spy, she was a nurse, she was so many things, but first and foremost, she was a freedom fighter. And throughout this month, starting tomorrow, there's an event in Harlem. Next Saturday, there's an event at Boys and Girls High School in Brooklyn from 1 to 4. And Brenda Stokely, who is a leader of the coalition, is going to be speaking about the Brooklyn event at the Word Rally today. But also on March 24th, there's another important event paying homage to Harriet Tubman, and that's going to be in the Bronx. And we all want to be there to show our support for the women workers for peace in La Pena del Bronx, who are putting, going to be putting on a magnificent um, display of vignettes and art shows, all in honor of Sister Harriet Tubman. 
And one of the leaders of Women Workers for Peace is here today. Her name is Zoila Ramirez, and please welcome her. Thank you, Monica. Good morning, sisters. We are here to celebrate in March 8th. What more? Hello? We are here celebrating March 8th. But more than celebrating March 8th, we are here to renew our commitment to the struggle, to show up and be present. Okay? We are also celebrating the life of Harriet Tubman at her 100th anniversary of her death. And she was one woman that at her time showed up, was present, and was committed to the struggles of her time. Uh, this incredible woman warrior um, was a freedom fighter. She led slaves to freedom, abolitionist. She, was, she struggled for justice, uh, spied the civil war, and a strategist. She actually uh, did the strategy on how to, uh, how to fight. Incredible. And she fought the system same system, the capital system that we still have now, a suffragette, uh, warrior for su women's issues, and a senior issues that is not very well known, but she also fought for senior issues. So, and this all was done with an incredible generosity of spirit and dignity. So today we celebrate, we celebrate, and actually today, her, tomorrow, her life. And the Women Workers for Peace have an activity on the 24th. Okay, on the 24th, we'll be passing out these flyers, and we have celebrated her life with little vignettes of her, uh, of the most important facts of her life. We also have uh, artwork by Virginia Ides celebrating her life, and it'll be just uh, a lot of history and a lot of fun. So please come, uh, and if you have the, um, there's a email there, so if you need uh, uh, email to, uh, please. So let us know, okay? So we'll send you the flyer. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next, also, uh, especially to any mass movement in any in any place, we are always need the youth. The youth is most important. They are characterized as the blood to a movement because it keeps on going and more and more youth are going to take the streets in consideration of all the things that are happening today as tuition keeps on rising and also jobs become unavailable to newly graduated youth. We need to ensure that the youth are, will continue and mobilize and go into the streets because women make up half of the youth as well. Women make up half of the population. We need the youth involved. And today we have the Red Youth, which is a young, which is a com communist youth group um, that take on certain things in different schools and communities, especially today we have Thea Connolly and Desiree De Loach. So bring it up, the youth, YS, youth and students, here we go. Give it up, make some noise. Uh, thank you. Uh, last night I wanted to brush up on uh, today's history about the fire, and I did. And uh, after I finished watching it, I felt nothing but anger, and I felt the need to write something about it. And this is what I'm saying. Oppression, patriarchy. What do these terms mean? Oppression? Oppression? Oppression is prolonged cruel or unjust treatment or control. Patriarchy is control by men of disproportionately large share of power. How does this relate today? It relates because we stand here where in history oppressed immigrant women rose up against oppression, yet suffered a cruel death of entrapment and were burned alive. The Shirtwaist Factory was run by two men, Max Blank and Isaiah Harris. 
When there was suspected talk of union, it became the employer's biggest fear. They worried about the unions because it would diminish their authority over the workplace. Blank and Harris relied on economic survival and so they invested in the latest technology. Along with new technology came high expectation of the workers. Workers were not allowed to make mistakes and if they did, they were charged by pay deductions from their paychecks. This meant for many families that they were going hungry that week. The workers were locked up like cattle. They were not allowed to break, not even for water, and when workers were finally allowed to leave, they had to go through a final inspection. This inspection included checking the purses of the workers, preventing theft. After these inspections, they left through the only exit that wasn't kept locked at the end of the day. For conditions and maltreatment these women had to endure to survive, there was no minimum wage or maximum hour laws. Naturally, those who are oppressed are faced with the challenge and necessity to rise up against their oppressor, and that's what these women did. They organized and went on strike in 1909, leaving the only place that separated them from survival and starvation. The strikers were faced with physical abuse and constant arrest. Yet despite this and public indifference, they con continued to strike and fight back with the hard line, we want a union. I want to fast forward to current day and briefly discuss patriarchy and some of its many forms. I recently read Bell Hook's book, All About Love. In this book, she touches upon her own life and discusses abuse and relationships of different types. Something stood out to me that hasn't really crossed my mind, and that is that patriarchy is encouraged not only by men for men, but also by women themselves. I have to admit, I had to stop and think about this for a while until I understood. Society breeds this despite its attempt to be progressive. Women are encouraged to do the housework, like cook, clean, raise the kids, while men do the tougher work, such as mowing the lawn, fixing up the house, and going to work. We as women are still placed in boxes. We are supposed to be dainty, quiet, and do what we are told. Hooks also brings up that growing up, she was the outgoing and assertive, while her brother was quiet and passive, and her parents found this to be unacceptable. After reading the book, I would listen to songs on the radio, watch movies and television shows with a different perspective and understanding. Sorry. I noticed that these tools, prime focus, was to encourage the dating scene, isolating women who wanted to work and be single, focus on themselves and be independent. Society encourages relationships, making us feel like we need someone, that we have to rely on someone else to survive, and our culture thrives on that. Even on the left here in America, sexism and, sexism and patriarchy exist in the heart of progressives. It's just harder to notice by the words they preach of rev revolution, justice, and liberation that are spoken to us to ease our mind. Words that are just words until they are put into action. Just like the women workers that fought back, we need to continue to fight back against the stereotypes and society's expectation of us. We need to unite with depressed women around the world, like in Saudi Arabia, where they are still seen as objects without rights, enslaved to their husbands and society. And I want to leave you with one of my favorite quotes by Che. Liberators do not exist. The people liberate themselves. I stand in front of all of you today, both disappointed and optimistic. Disappointed at the school system that pushed me through without learning about the lives of revolutionary women, such as Angela Davis, Emma Goldman, and many others, and only minimal amount about Harriet Tubman and Rosa Parks. I'm disappointed that this is happening nationwide on many school campuses. But more importantly, I'm optimistic. I'm optimistic when I look out into this crowd of beautiful, strong, revolutionary women. Woo! Optimistic Woo! at the opportunities that we all have to teach young women what it means to be strong, what it means to not be afraid to stand up and fight for what they believe in. It is our duty, our responsibility, to raise our children to raise their fists, to have a dialogue with one another and to bring an end to patriarchy, and to love themselves and love each other. One of my favorite signs that I've seen from Occupy Wall Street was one a friend of mine had. It said, a woman's place is in the revolution. Yeah. <laughs> so I thank all of those who um, helped mentor me and who are continuing to mentor me. Let's keep learning, keep mentoring, and keep fighting. All power to the people. Thank you. Just by hearing these two talks, I think the struggle is in good hands for future generations. And... Um, I want to introduce another special revolutionary youth who is fighting for socialism 
here and around the world. And she is going to do a cultural spoken word because we know culture is very, very important in our struggles. It gives us inspiration along with teaching us and inspiring us. So I'm very proud to introduce Dinae Anderson, who is a youth organizer with Workers World Party. Hi, everybody. <laughs> um, so here goes nothing. <laughs> I am the daughter of the slaves, the workers, the woman, and the mother. I have been the daughter of chains, and I shall break the cycle today. I can go on and on about the oppressor's wrongs and the pigs that kill my brothers that bring tears of sadness to our mothers. Yet, I wake up in the morning basking revolution in my heart. Even when I see the chains of low-wage labor and silent anger spreading into deep oceans of the masses, like the bosses like to tear our class apart, their hypocrisy, their slanderous hearts cutting into our pride, leaving us left in the isolation and poverty in the world of capitalistic concoctions. They are the ones who keep us in chains. The ones that try to control my body and leave me insane. Sometimes I feel like as a woman I can't live this way. I look in the mirror and see the battle scars too deep. Scars that have been on my skin for far too long. I get to my eyes and I'm able to see that as a woman I am strong. The lights in my pupils have stayed alive. For the struggle for our liberation never dies. I know it continues and I celebrate it with all of you. Because I sing of freedom and I march and dance in its blood. It soaks on my combat boots and in my skirt. And I am ready for war because we have nothing to lose but our chains and with revolution in our hearts our bodies and souls we will break destroy and eradicate those chains so that someday soon when the world is strong my daughters will be the ones who keep revolution beaming on thank you Diane, for that for that amazing performance and um spoken word piece um, again, we are here today in this particular spot on this corner of Washington and Green because it is the same place where the Triangle Shirtwaist fa Factory burned down in March 25th, 1911, where 146 immigrant women, Jewish and Russian, were killed, jumping out of this building in order trying to figure out how to survive and fell to their deaths, and people just burned alive. We need to remember this because we need to make sure that we honor those women that have died and that have sacrificed their lives to, to ensure that we have better working and living conditions. Remember that without workers, without unions, we would not be anywhere. We would not have a weekend. We would not have certain basic wages, minimum wages, and we need to continue, especially now in when Obama is pushing all of these immigration proposals, immigrant rights proposals, we need to make sure that we are vigilant and on guard for the immigrant workers who make almost 11 million people in this country that are undocumented. And we have to continue to fight and mobilize for those workers and immigrant people. And today we have Marina from the May 1st Coalition. If Marina can come up here. Rosa Diaz because she is one of our main amazing compañeras that is leading the fight for immigrant rights here in New York City. Marina, come on, make it louder. Hello, hello, where is your respect? Si se puede, 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 si se puede. Thank you, my name is Marina, I come from Guatemala, and I've been in the United States for a long time ago. But when I came, I am from a very strong culture, when men were is the law. And I've been breaking all those laws before I came to the United States. I break, I break the law with my parents, I told them before, say that I cannot continue my uh, high school because I was supposed to know how to cook and soon I will get married and go back into the kitchen. And I just think, I say, oh, oh. And then <laughs> when I, I want to work because we, I come from very poor family and still my broken English, I hope you understand. But I came from very, very uh, humble and, and poor family. 
uh, my father was very ha having a hard time to meet all the needs at home and I said, you know what, you don't make enough money. I have to go work. He said, not only men work in factory, blah, 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 all that. And I said, okay. Later, I started looking for a job. Before the age of 18, I started um, getting papers, fake papers, and getting to factory work. And I started working. He didn't like the idea. But I started um, affording something in the family, and then he just not happy, but see that what I was saying, that was, I have a meaning. He needs help and I was able to do the help. Now, a man but a woman. Then he said that we cannot go to school and I said, Mama, I want to go back to school. Your daddy don't want to go to school. I said, I don't care. I'm going to night school. And I just say, you going to back me up and I go back to school. I'm talking a long time ago when, in my country, women at 10 o'clock in the street is not good. And I just did it. He didn't like the idea. He played instrument, he played marimba, with a xylophone, and he said, you cannot go back, to, you cannot play marimba. I said, okay, I will listen to how they play, and I play marimba, even I have my marimba here in the United States, and I continue doing performance when I can. And he said not to go to school, eventually I couldn't go back, finish my school, because life was very hard, and I was pushed by the economy of my country to come here. He didn't know I crossed the border. I was only 21 years old, and I said, I'm going. My mother, my mother was shaking every time. I said, I'm going to do something. And I just <laughs> say, well, I'm going to the United States. I can't live anymore here. I sued a factory in my country who was taking money away from me. I didn't know what I was doing. I said, no, I need to do something. I have, uh, I was in a blacklist in my country after they gave me the time in the factory. Nobody hired me. I was already in a worse situation than before I started working. No shoes, really bad. I left the school and I started looking for ways to come to the United States. As an immigrant, undocumented woman, girl, I was not, I was not even. Anyways, I came, I was, that was very hard for me to leave my family because we didn't have opportunities to continue working and to continue supporting my family, my brothers. We are 11, and I was one of the oldest ones, and I see that everybody needs something. I couldn't do anything else but to just hit the road. And I came, I crossed the border, finally I get to United States, Santa Monica, and eventually I got married, and nothing went fine. As soon as I finished, I went back to school. I finished my school, and I graduated from early childhood education, bachelor degree. And I just say that we, when we women want to do something, we can do it. Because I didn't do it when I was a youth. I went to school when I had two children, seven and eight years old, working full time as a housekeeper and going full time to college. Still, my English is broken and my grammar is not good, but I made it. And I just think that everybody can do that. Everybody, all women who went to do it can do it. And I think. Uh, Back home, uh, all women, if they will think that, no, you can do it. See, somebody say, you don't do this, you can do it. We can do it. I didn't uh, expect to come here, and now I am, um, every time I see women in jail with the children, immigrants who've been taken, because the only, the only crime, the new, new immigrant, because we all immigrants, immigrants from 100, 200 years ago, but immigrants at the end in the United States, we all immigrants, the new wave of immigrants are suffering severe persecution because they are very good target to, to blame them for all wrong in the, in the system. They are good people to blame them because they, are, they, they don't have rights. And I see how mothers and women, young girls like me, still, I'm talking about 42 years ago, and they're still jumping the ball to come here anyway. And I am so proud to be here. I appreciate everybody. And I am part of the main first coalition, which is a great honor for me, as a part of the women who are still struggling, who are still fighting for the rights. And now we all continue to fight for the people who come to the United States with the whole big scene is have no, no, um, no uh, job opportunities, no opportunities back in the home, 
to continue living with the family. Nobody decided to come here and say, oh, I would love to go over there. No, everybody would like to be with the family for years and see grandchildren and children together, but we cannot have the opportunity because the system is very, very um, broken and the immigration system is broken. They don't give us the opportunity to come in the, in the safe ways. We have to run the cross, we have to run Arizona, we have to move back and forth hiding against the police, hiding from the police, hiding from everybody, and letting everybody take advantage because we have no right. And I am proud to, um, to be here and honor Hari Thaman, who will be my hero and is part of the job we have to continue doing as a women, celebrating great women who make us continue being big and stronger. Thank you very much. And again, we have to be there May 1st. Union Square, what time Union, uh, Union Square on May 1st? What time is that? Four? Four o'clock. Everybody should be there. That's International Workers' Day. Okay. Thank you very much, Marina. And next, I'm very proud to introduce a longtime union, trade unionist, and she's also an indigenous activist. She is from the Cherokee, Huron, and Muskegee descent. Please welcome Sister Stephanie Adohai. We're all in mourning still today for Comandante Chavez, and I'd like to give a shout out and a salute to the major support and, and the brotherhood that he showed to the indigenous peoples of Venezuela and across this hemisphere, the land of uh, the Condor and Great Turtle Island. Being here on this site today, I know that he would be moved as, as we are, thinking back to the history. What was it, 130 years ago when the women died that day? Well, because the bosses valued their profits over their lives, that they locked the only door out. When the fire came, something like 20 people died. They, the women crowded into a balcony that then collapsed. And then there was a brave brother who worked in the building who was trying to shuttle people out to the only functioning elevator until the fire got so bad that women were diving into the elevator shaft and it collapsed the working elevator and no one had any way out but to jump. And to this day, we know that the 1% still value their profits over our lives. Didn't Nike do this again in the 90s to women in Indonesia at a shoe factory and Walmart warehouses? to this day maybe in some places, are still doing this to the overnight shift, the midnight shift workers. They're locked in for the night. We women are, are, we know in our bones that workers' rights, health and safety rights are always women's rights too. It doesn't matter whether you're one of the probably tens of thousands, maybe even millions of women in, in this area in New York who have to scan repeatedly at a checkout stand that you get carpal tunnel and your wrist you know, are permanently damaged, or you're standing all day, and your feet go, and you develop, you know, uh, uh, damage to your feet that can't be fixed, and your back hurts, or you're sitting in front of a computer for hours on end, you're not really allowed to go take your federally mandated lunch break, or your 15 minutes over four hours, take proper breaks. No, you're sitting there squished in front of a computer screen until you've got neck, eye, and back issues, and there's loads of other health and safety issues in every job environment from the very air that we breathe, the air quality, to freedom from harassment and favoritism on the job. It's just so much, it's, it's overwhelming. And we know that until the day comes that, we know right now that, that union represent, representation may be at a very low mark historically. But that's a tide, and tides come in and go out. We were surely reminded of that in Superstorm Sandy, weren't we? Yep. And we know that when the tide is high, you know, we're going to be at the forefront of, fri of fighting as we will every day until then to win back our unions and to make them empowered as a voice for our rights and, and to take back control of the working environment and jobs from the 1% who sacrifice our lives and our health in the interest of their profits. Let's just get a 
our blood a little bit warm. The sun is coming out. Let's get ready to march. We have a few more speakers and then we're going to go join our sisters in word over there in the park. But let's start it up. Women workers are under attack. What do we do? Unite like that. that. Women workers are under attack. What do we do? Stand up like that. Public schools are under attack. What do we do? Stand up like that. Women workers are under attack. What do we do? Stand up like that. People of color are under attack. What do we do? Stand up like that. Immigrant workers are under attack. What do we do? Stand up like that. Women youth are under attack. What do we do? Stand up like that. Imprisoned prisoners are under attack. What do we do? Stand up like that. That is right. We need to unite. We need to stand up. We need to fight all different forms of oppression. And we have sisters who have been fighting, but they are in prison because of this cruel and unjust justice system that we are supposed to rely on. One of the main people that we have that are in prison, a uh, political prisoner right now, is Lynn Stewart, who is an attorney who would actually um, defend the poor and pe poor people um, and people that uh, don't usually have access to representation. So here we have today uh, Dolores Cox from the International Action Center to help to read a statement from for Lynn Stewart today for International Working Women's Day. Um, that's Lynn Stewart, in case some of you don't know her. Okay, Lynn is a political prisoner. She's been in prison for several years now um, as a terrorist. Okay. She's a lawyer, she's an attorney. She was representing her client, who is the, bl the blind sheikh from Egypt. And so, um, because she was representing him well, okay, the US government decided to charge her with terrorism. So she's been in prison for several years now. Um, we refer to her lovingly as the people's lawyer, okay? She's a civil rights lawyer, she's a human rights lawyer, she's the people lawyer, she's our lawyer. Um, Lynn sent us a message yesterday for our event today. Right now, Lynn is serving a 10-year sentence in prison um, for, like I say, representing her client very well. She was originally given 28 months as a sentencing, and the U.S. government appealed that. And when her case went back to court, they moved it from 28 months to 10 years. Okay, Lynn is in her 70s now. Um, Recently, she's been diagnosed with cancer now in prison, um, and the cancer is spreading. So we need everybody to remember Lynn, to keep her in our hearts, in our minds, and send love, okay? We also have an address to give everyone if they want to write to Lynn, okay? She'd love to get letters from all of us. She's not doing too well now. She's in treatment, okay? So she, of course, has good days, bad days, all right? Um, but... Well, you find out where Lynn is at when you hear her words. Okay. This is a cry from deep in my soul on behalf of my sisters. Abused, forgotten, made marginal. We are always aware of our place on the rungs of the ladder of oppression. Based on race and class and sex. Since this needs be brief, I want to first talk about sisters, Indian, Asian, and Native American. It is the most difficult concept to conceive of the evil, predatory communities these women on different sides of the world live in. Rape is violence, capital V, capital I, capital O, L, E, N, C, E, not sex. It has been routine for men to absolutely do as they will without any fear of retribution legally. There have been no courts to prosecute, to punish, P-U-N-I-S-H, capital letters. My first rejoinder is also to urge self-defense that will always get a woman to court. But she may be the victim again in court. Right now, the Congress has passed a law, and Lynn puts law in quotes, that we hope will protect Native Indian women here. But there have been many laws, in quote. There is greater hope in India, where there has been a righteous female uprising that cannot and will not be ignored. Okay. 
So she goes on to say, surely, surely, and briefly, I just want to mention, women who are not in the cruel world but suffer behind bars, cages, if you will, some of us are political here because the government has criminalized our actions or framed us. I call out to you to remember and cherish Marie Mason, a green warrior, Afia Sadiqi, a heroine in her own Pakistan, for her brave resistance, and also me, me, still fighting, still struggling, still loving you all. In love, in struggle, Lynn. Free Lynn Stewart and all political prisoners. Free Lynn Stewart and all political prisoners. Free Lynn Stewart and all political prisoners. Student Coordinating Committee. As a group that has com committed to raising revolutionary political consciousness, that means bringing to the forefront how this violent economic system has affected women. More specifically, our black and brown sisters living inside and outside the borders of the U.S. imperialist monster. Every day we exist in a society that tells us that we are not safe. The commodification of a woman's body has made us disposable. Violence against women in its many forms has become an accepted and normalized aspect of our existence. Be it in the U.S. prison industrial complex or even in our schools, it has devoured our communities. There are more black women and men in prison today than there were slaves in the 18th century. Black women are left to take care of their families on their own and they're also stuck working for menial wages in gendered industries. We face criminalization and sexual harassment on a daily basis. Furthermore, the women of immigrant communities that have, displaced, that have been displaced out of their home countries by U.S. imperialism are at the mercy of a misogynist, exploitative system, um, as well as white supremacists. That said, it is also too important to note that as revolutionaries, the RSCC has committed itself to also bringing forward the struggle within our ranks. It is not enough to say that we are anti-imperialist, but yes, as a, as a woman uh, said earlier, we face misogyny amongst our very own male comrades, male and female comrades. We need also a cultural revolution as we fight for uh, liberation of the entire of the proletariat. So, again, it is not enough to stand against women's oppression, but because capitalism is a patriarchal institution, it is necessary to unite the women's struggle with the struggle of the proletariat. A great revolutionary once said, women hold up half the sky. So we must note how women have been at the forefront of revolutionary struggle. That said, long live proletarian feminism. Long live proletarian feminism, everybody. All right, bye-bye, thank you. Thank you, Fernanda. Next, okay, we're gonna be marching in a few minutes. We just have two more speakers and then one more tribute to the women of the triangle. And then we're gonna be marching out. And once we get to the park, just to keep in mind, I want to talk to, to Brenda, the, our Brenda and Roberto, our wonderful photographers, that we want to take a picture of the whole group with the armbands. So make sure you have an armband before or once we get into the park so we can all take a picture for the International Women's Alliance uh, website. 
Okay, next we're going to hear from a longtime activist, oh, who is also a retired registered nurse and also a retired nurse practitioner. She takes care of us when there's demonstrations, large and small, always with her medical bag and a lot of compassion. And she's also one of the main staffers of the Solidarity Center. Please welcome Sharon Eolas. Who gets all our sound permits, too. <laughs> well, first, I want to salute all the sisters and brothers who are here to commemorate International Working Women's Day. We are here to honor those who died in the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire in 1911. And Let's face it, it's because of capitalist profit that these workers, largely women, but also men, died in this tragic fire. As women, we stand together, black, white, Latin, Asian, Native American, Palestinian, LGBT, youth, students, workers, seniors, able and disabled. We know that every issue is a woman's issue. This weekend is the 100th anniversary of Harriet Tubman's, uh, centennial of Harriet Tubman's death. Bear with me a second, I'm going to turn this over. Uh, she was born in slavery, badly beaten, brutally beaten as a youth, and this gave her the courage to run and leave the South and win her freedom. But that was just the beginning of her journey. She then made a remarkable, time, uh, remarkable situation. She took on freeing hundreds of slaves. That included her family and hundreds of others. She made 19 trips back into the South with a huge bounty on her head for every time that she left. You know, and came back and forth. Along the way, she met John uh, uh, John, Brown. John Brown, and he named her General Tubman. It was so well-deserved in title. During the Civil War, Tubman worked for the Union Army. She functioned in different roles, cook, scout, spy, nurse, and a leader of troops in military campaigns under Confederate fire. I was interested because, as a nurse, to understand or, or learn something about what she did in the Army. Obviously, health care at that time was very different than it is now. But in her many years when she lived in Maryland, she became a healer and learned to use herbs and roots to cure different things. So when there was an epidemic of dysentery, a form of diarrhea, she was certain it could be cured if the roots were available in the woods nearby. She acquired the roots, gave them to one of the soldiers. He recovered, and he was in a state of dying from loss of fluids, and again applied this in her practice throughout her time there working as a nurse. In today's world of modern, sophisticated health care, the medical industrial complex his only interest is in profits, not health care needs of humanity globally. The new health care bill in the U.S. does provide some health care to a number of folks who had no access because they had pre-existing conditions. It has provisions for expanding Medicaid in states and additional monies for rural communities. But, and the big but is, it is up to the states to decide if they want to join in and participate in this plan. Already, several of them have decided against it because they would have to match the funds from the federal government. With millions of folks out of work, who would, and with this new program of um, health care, it would mean they'd be expected to pay into a health exchange to get their health care. If you don't pay into it, then you are penalized. So we have millions out of work, both documented and undocumented, who many of youth, and those I see here today, who have no access, are not able to get jobs, therefore do not have incomes. This means 
there's nothing out there from this health care plan for you because what's happening is the medical insurance plans got huge bucks for taking on this new health bill that was provided that the government has uh, called into practice and for us the 99 percent there is not very much there in other words while health care should be a right and a privilege it does not exist for many millions of people in this country in closing we should take note of what sister harriet tubman who set a splendid example for all of us to follow and to carry out the struggle in which every issue is a woman's issue and we must fight back I want to salute Harriet Tubman, Harriet Tubman Presente. Thank you, Sharon. Um, everybody, please give a bigger round of applause for Sharon because she always gives our sound permits. She's a, she's a nurse, she's a health worker. You know, my mom also is a health worker and it is really true. This system, this medical system just bleeds us dry, especially when we have to figure out the loans to try to pay for all these medical bills. And that is something wrong, right? Social services should be free for the people because this is our society. We're not supposed to be bleeding people out of their money just to take care of them because they're sick. No, we need to make sure we got to fight for these resources to make sure that our people are okay. This is basic. These are basic needs. We need these basic needs to be taken care of in order for us to live. We can't be fighting and fighting and dying and dying just to make sure that we have to stay alive. So today, not only do we need to make social services, and I'm going to tell you one easy thing that U.S. can do in order to make sure that we have U.S. social services for everybody. Cut the budget for the military. Cut the budget for the military. We can no longer be spending so much tax dollars on drones or on military intervention expansion of U.S. imperialism. We need to end that. We need to cut that because we know that this U.S. imperialism is only there to make sure that the U.S. stays on top and we need to stop it. We need to end U.S. imperialism. And today we have a sister, Carmen Valencia, from member of the Vieques Women and uh, alliance and that is so important to bring up u.s imperialism for the fact that puerto rico in 1898 due to the treaty of paris was bought by the u.s we, along with cuba and the philippines we got to make sure that we free our sisters we free these colonies we free these so-called com commonwealth we are no longer able to make sure that free our people free our sisters in these different groups of uh, countries and commonwealths okay because this is still a problem. This is still a problem for our sisters in these different areas of the world. So I call on my sister Carmen to come up here. Good morning, everyone. I am very excited because I never thought that I was going to be here today talking to you. But I can give you an example of what women can do when they decide to do it. We were able to stop the practices in Vieques. Yes. 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 We changed the uh, chain and the lock of the gate of the base, and women were the ones that were guarding that keys. We only let the, whip, the men that were working there as civilian guards in and out of the base. Whenever a truck or a jeep from the military came to enter, we said no, and we never let them in. And then we decided to stop the practices as placing ourselves as human shields. And we were able to stop for one year, one whole year, the practices in Vieques. We also got a referendum. We work with the women work day and night. So that referendum was clear to everyone. We had to vote for the military to leave Vieques immediately, not stay one day more. And it was very great when President Bush said, they don't want us here, we have to leave. Because we had a great referendum where 85% of the voters came to vote. We got 65 or 67% uh, percent of the voters voting for the military to leave immediately, and they did. We still have things that we have to accomplish, like better health and better housing 
everything because the military stopped us from really developing our land. But now we are struggling, as this banner says, our struggle continues. We haven't stopped, we are still fighting to get all the things that the military stopped us from forgetting. So, very luck, very luck to every woman, and don't stop because you're a woman, because women can do the same things that men can do. After all, if there were no women, there would be no babies, nothing. So, keep on with your work. Thank you. Thank you, Carmen. And I just want to say, Carmen is speaking tonight at the Union the the Theological Seminary at 7 p.m. So you, uh, 120th Street and and Broadway. So you should see Esperanza over there if you want more information about her speaking engagement to, tonight. And I have to say, I was in Vieques in 1999, and I saw the devastation that the U.S. Navy caused on that beautiful island. And people are still dealing with the ecological damage and also the health issue uh, situation in uh, throughout Puerto Rico and especially those who live on the island. So I saw for myself. So this is why it's important to demand self-determination for oppressed people, including those who are still being colonized today from Puerto Rico to the Dominican Republic to Haiti and elsewhere around the world. And also in terms of health care, we cannot forget the issue of reproductive justice. Thank you. We have to remember that is part of health care is a right. Reproductive justice for all women of all ages to be able to control our bodies without, telling, without the state interfering in our lives. So this is a very, very important issue that our coalition adheres to and defends. So now I am very honored to welcome, how many of you all know about the postal worker struggle, the, the issue of fighting against the privatization of the post office, which is very, very important. I mean, they're closing post office all around, offices all around the country, laying off just tens of thousands of, of post office workers and shutting down service on Saturdays that has now gone into effect. And we have a sister here who is one of the main organizers of the Community Labor United for Postal Jobs and Services, and she's also a leader of the Chelsea Coalition on Housing. These issues are connected, and I'm sure she'll tell us why. So I'm very honored to uh, welcome Rosa Maria de la Torre. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Monica. Greetings, sisters, mothers, all uh, working women. Greetings from the Chelsea Coalition on Housing and Community Labor United for Postal Jobs and Services. A uh, sister from a uh, postal union was supposed to be here. Uh, she was not able to make it. Therefore, I will make two brief statements on both organizations. I will start with the coalition. In the spirit of the motto of the International Working uh, Women Coalition, that all issues are a woman's issues, Housing and tenants' rights are a woman's issue. Single women, single mothers, grandmothers, aunts, raising grandchildren, nephews and nieces are all tenants. Tenants affected by the onslaught from the Rent Stabilization Association. Most definitely a misnomer because they are a landlord's lobby. From the, uh, under attack from the real estate and the developers camp. There are sold, they get sold out elected officials to vote down laws that have been created to protect tenants. They get also upstate Albany to change the laws to facilitate the greed of the landlords. We would have to de uh, define development under our own terms because under the capitalist system that we live, development means displacement of long-term tenants in our communities, working class tenants that have stabilized our communities, and that is why now the rich want our communities. This means that we lose services, we lose the mom and pop businesses. It means that it affects and downgrades the quality of life of all tenants. 
many of, obviously more than half are women and children. The onslaught of the development is not targeting the largest and supposed best public housing in the nation, NYCHA, New York City Housing Authority. The, bu the bureaucrats in NYCHA are not trying to sell the public land to developers to supposedly create a affordable housing. Well, let me tell you about this supposed affor affordable housing. The, the development that already went up in Chelsea, taking the parking lot from Chelsea Elliott, is, uh, is the affordable housing they say they're building is for starting salaries of $75,000 and up. Then they give a very small percentage for lower income. This is not the affordable housing we need. I'm not going to speak more on this because I believe somebody else spoke on NYCHA, but I am going to add something else in reference to our mayor. He just recently uh, made a statement that there are no homeless people sleeping in the street. <laughs> liar, liar, liar. All you have to do is walk down the street, take the train. You know there's thousands of homeless people. Their own uh, statistics working force of the post office is uh, consisted of very high percentage of women and mostly women and within that uh, percentage mostly women of color this is just another example of how workers are under attack from the uh, corporate system capitalist system that is so greedy they will stop at nothing if they continue with their plans Nationally, we will be losing about a quarter of a million jobs. So what's this hypocrisy of creating, supposedly trying to create jobs? The postal service is in danger of being privatized, not through the internet, not to private competition, not labor costs, not recession. Here again, those elected officials, a 2006 congressional law which unnecessarily forces the Postal Service to pre-fund retiree health benefits 75 years. That's right, 75 years in advance is responsible for sending the Postal Service into a death spiral. The USPS has also overpaid tens of billions into two pension funds. Postal operations actually made over a hundred million profit in the last fiscal quarter if not for the congressional mandates. No other agency has to do this. 30% of postal jobs are held by people of color. Veterans hold over 20%. Women over 40% of postal positions. Continued closes of processing plants and post offices economically undermine our communities and small businesses. Not only would these living wage jobs be eliminated by privatization, but the world's lowest postage rate and most efficient mail service would be at the mercy of for-profit corporations. Let me just throw this in while I, uh, so I don't forget it. The postal service is the only constitutional service, is the only constitutional service, and they're taking that too. Numerous studies have proven privatization raises consumer cost, lowers workers' wages and benefits, and decreases quality whenever government services are turned into profit ventures. I want to announce that um, uh, the unions are organizing a major uh, rally for March 24th. I want to urge everybody to attend. Uh, this will be at the main post office on 8th Avenue and uh, 31st. Well, the, it's 31 and 33. But before that noon rally, there's going to be an earlier rally. rally. It's going to be at 10, from 10 to 11.30. I want to invite everybody to come to Chelsea. We're going to have a rally at 15th Street and 9th Avenue. The reason we chose that corner is because the Port Authority Post Office, which is on 9th Avenue and 15th Street, is on the list for being shut down. No coincidence, 
right in front of Fulton houses, right in front of a community that is very poor, that is mostly non-white. We are very, we are want to work with the unions and that's why we made it so early. And fr uh, from there we're going on to, uh, to 31st and 33rd. So I urge everybody to attend if possible. We also need endorsers for this rally. So if, um, I would like right now openly ask the International Working Women's uh, uh, Coalition to please endorse our rally. And if there is any other uh, organizations that would like to endorse, please approach me when I finish speaking, which I'm almost done. Um, and um, hope to see you there. Maybe we can take a consensus right now. Yes. Let's. How many people want to feel that the coalition should support the March 24th rally? Yeah. Coalition yeah. members. Yeah. Okay, I'm sure there's no nays or abstentions. <laughs> okay, before, okay, we're just about to wrap up, but we have one more tribute to the Triangle Fire uh, victims. But I just want to announce, Again, March 24th is going to be a very, very important day. Uh, before that, though, again, March 16th, and everyone should get a leaflet. Get a leaflet from the International Working, Working uh, Women's Coalition. We have a whole bunch of them here announcing two important Harriet Tubman events. This is not the only day that we're going to be honoring Harriet Tubman. March 16th, from 1 to 4 at Boys and Girls High School, in Bedford-Stuyvesant, Brooklyn. There's going to be an event where a number of students are going to be putting on a wonderful skit uh, about not only Harriet Tubman, but also Rosa Parks, whose centennial of her birth was February 4th. So, and so it's going to be honoring both of these tremendous freedom fighters against racism and against all forms of repression. Um, and then on March 24th, what Rosa raised about the postal workers uh, demonstration, which is a na nationally coordinated actions that is from 12 to 3, along with the other event that Rosa raised at 1030. And then after that, please come to the other Harriet Tubman tribute that's being organized by Women Workers for Peace and La Pena del Bronx. That's going to start at 3 o'clock, so you don't have to miss the postal worker uh, demonstration or this important event at the Bronx Art Space, which is 305 East 140th Street. So you can get a leaflet from our sisters, from Women Workers for Peace, and also get a leaflet from the Coalition. All this information is available both in English and in Spanish. Okay, now, what I would like to do now is call up Sue Harris, who is a coordinator of the People's Video Network. People's Video Network is always there, taking incredible video of all of the events and going on in the city. Um, and so she's going to read another batch of names of those who were victimized by the fire. We can't read all 146 names, but please, when you hear these names, just think about all of the 146, mainly immigrant women and some men who lost their lives at this fire. And also, more recently, the tragic fire that happened in Bangladesh last year, where about 112 workers, mainly women, lost their lives in a fire there. So all of this is connected to the struggle against capitalist greed and imperialist exploitation. And we were hoping to have someone from Desi, Rise, Desi rising up, but they weren't able to come today. Um, but we, we know that they're here in spirit because they have spoken out against this tremendous um, crime against humanity. So we stand in solidarity with our Bangladeshi uh, sisters and our sisters all over the world who are fighting all forms of oppression and repression. And again, we have to unite to win our liberation. We say no war to women at home and abroad. And again, every issue is a women's issue. So I now want to call up Sue Harris to read these names. And then we're going to take a picture here. Roberto and Brenda are going to take a picture of us. And then we're going to go right to the park to the word rally. So, Sue. Okay. 
Um, Mrs. Mary Gallo, 23. Bertha Gibe, 25. Molly Gernstein, 17. Selena Gitlin, 17. Esther Goldfield and Esther Goldstein. No, no age is given. Lena Goldstein, 22. Mary Goldstein, 11. <laughs> Yetta Goldstein, 20. Esther Gorfield, 22. Mrs. Irene Gramatasio, 24. Esther Harris, 21. Mary Herman, 40. Ida Jakubowski, no age. Kaplan, 20. Ida Kenowich, 18. Cober, 30. Becky Kessler, no age. Jacob Klein, 23. Sarah Kupla, no age given. Fanny Lounsvold, 24. Nettie Lefkowitz, 28. Max Lehrer, 19. Sam Lehrer. Kate Leone, 14. Rosie D. Lermac, 19. Mary Leventhal, 22. Jenny Levin, 19. Abe Levine, Max Levine. Pauline Levine, 19. Catherine Maltese, Lucia Maltese, 20. Rosalie Maltese, 14. Mrs. Maria Manara, 27. Rose Manofsky, 22. Mrs. Michela Marciano, 25. Minnie Mayer, Yetta Myers, 19. Bettina Miali, 18. Francis Miali, 21. Presente! 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 So right now, what we're going to be doing is a group photo all together, everybody who joined us for this uh, morning rally, and then we'll go in March. So everybody, please go behind this banner. Let's make sure that everybody's in the sun. Um, Actually, it wasn't better, right? Oh, yeah. Stand up like that! People of color, under attack, what do we do? Stand up like that! 